Oh, I'm, we're live. I've got the Headleys. It's Mark and Claire Headley. Never have I had them in the same bloody room. Look at them. Say <laughs> things, guys. Say things to the people. Hello, people. Hey, Thanks guys. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining the stream. <laughs> Thanks. Welcome back to the channel. This is great. We are streaming live on both of our channels. That's Blown for Good and mine is Andrew Gold. If you're watching on one of the other ones, of the those ones, go over to the other one and subscribe if that makes any sense. We're going to be talking about how Mark and Claire, well, sort of were in, not sort of, but were in Scientology, how they left Scientology, how they got together and what's going on and everything to do with that. I know that Claire, you know, I've spoken to Claire a few times. Mark, I've only, I think, spoken with you once. Uh, I know Claire was born in born in Scientology, but what about you, Mark? What, what was your Scientology origin story? Uh, my parents moved to Hollywood uh, from Missouri in um, 1979 when I was about six years old. And um, shortly after we moved to California, one of my dad's friends actually got my mom into Scientology. And my dad um, didn't want to have anything to do with it. So, um, so from about, I'd say six or seven, that's when my Scientology upbringing uh, started. And um, yeah, so from about six, six or seven-ish. Okay, you were, I mean, you were, for all intents and purposes, almost, born into Scientology. I mean, is, is that, do you even remember a time before that? Not really. I don't have many memories that predate um, us moving to California. Like I think I had a birthday party when I was like five or maybe five or six that I remember, but that's about it. I don't, I don't really remember anything else besides that. How did you end up in the same place where Claire was so that you were able to meet? Um, so after we moved to Los Angeles, um, as a, as a young child, I went to Scientology schools and, um, we lived, my, my dad actually lived in an apartment building that was across the street from one of their, uh, the Scientology's main properties called the Celebrity Center in Hollywood. And so I was around it all the time. And my mother moved um, she lived near this big blue um, complex in Hollywood, which is the other big uh, Scientology complex. So no matter whose house I was staying at, I was, you know, a block from one of their major, major centers. And I hung out. I, I went to Scientology school, so I hung out with Scientology kids. And then ultimately, I ended up working in the Sea Organization in Los Angeles um, for about a year or so. And then I went to their international headquarters which are in the uh, middle of the Cali uh, California desert in a location called Gilman Hot Springs. And uh, it's referred to as the Int base or the international base. And, um, and I worked at a company there, a Scientology media production company called Golden Era Productions. And they produced all the films and cassettes and videos and, all, and anything audiovisual for Scientology was produced there. And I started working there at 1990, and I want to say in 91 or 92, um, Claire showed up, and she was a, a supervisor. In, in Scientology terms, a supervisor is not somebody who um, manages other uh, people, and not other employees. It's a person that oversees them studying on Scientology courses and Scientology training materials. And Claire was my supervisor. And, um, it, and that's... it's the it's the real world equivalent of a teacher. Yeah, right. There you go. The, but yeah, so no, I arrived at the headquarters in September 1991, um, <clears throat> which is the first time that uh, our paths crossed. We were now, you know, for all intents and purposes, co-prisoners of a, of the headquarters. <laughs> did it feel like you were a prisoner at that time, Claire? Yeah, it did. I mean, you know. Uh, Arriving at that property, you're like, whoa, what have I gotten myself into? The security guards, it's just next level. It's remote. You're, nobody's allowed to know where you work. So my, my mom and my stepdad were required to sign over guardianship of me when I was 16 years old as a prerequisite to be allowed to work there. And they were not even allowed to know my physical location. So all those elements you know you kind of it's it's a one-way path into scientology and you very quickly realize that but yeah of course i was not le letting those thoughts come to the forefront but it very definitely was like a prison compound that's it's interesting to think because when you're born into it the same obviously with aaron smith levin and i think the same for you mark when you joined so young uh 
it must be so hard to think that there's even this like outside world. I know it's the WOG word, which I don't think I, I think I got flagged for using that one time because it, it's also a slur for uh, black people that some people use as well. Uh, but that's Jehovah's uh, Jehovah's Witness equivalent is the worldly people. I think the Mormon Mormons say that as well. Like what what were they to to you guys? These uh, what were we to you? <laughs> yeah. So. Um, the outside world, any anyone outside of Scientology, you were encouraged to isolate from, uh, not have any contact with. We, you know, for me, from from birth, essentially, I was taught that the outside world was a very dangerous place, and um, and then by the time we got to the headquarters, um, it was anyone that um left from that place their life would be ruined they'd be flipping burgers for the rest of their life they'd fall down the path of addiction and you know other nefarious things uh you were just taught that it was absolutely not an option you you know not only are you physically uh at a very remote location with no contact to the outside world but also if you leave then your whole family will cut up, cut you off hmm. That flipping burgers thing is quite specific. I think I've heard that before. Is that it's a specific thing? I, I suppose it's quite insulting to some. There was that Good Burger movie with the guys Keenan and Kel. I don't know what their actors' names are. They seem to enjoy flipping burgers. There must have been people within Scientology who were flipping the burgers that people were eating. Was there a cafeteria that people ate from? Yeah. Yes. But, but the thing is with that, it's particular to the C organization. So if you're in the Scientology, that's where you sign the billion year contracts. That's where we worked. We worked at that place. So they sort of um, and there and Hubbard does have these policy letters where he explains um, like there was a there once was a, a Native American and he was part of a tribe and it was more shameful to him to leave the tribe than to just go do something else. It was the leaving of the tribe which brought him great shame and that sort of thing. So um, they sort of indoctrinate you that if you leave, that's it. You got nothing else. This is where this is where you're supposed to be. And if you leave, um, and and this was the funny thing that's to say best chase or best case scenario, you would end up flipping burgers, and most likely you would be homeless and just uh, die a bum. But if you um, were lucky when you after you left the sea organization, you might end up flipping burgers. And the the crazy thing is, is I knew a guy. He was a master carpenter. And um, and I worked with him for for almost the I, I want to say the entire 15 years I was there. He was there. And when he left, he didn't know what he should do. And um, he ended up working at Burger King, flipping burgers, because that's what he was told he should probably he would probably end up. Doing. Oh, and he actually was. And then when we we tracked him down and we found him, we were like, did you give me me making good money just doing carpenter work and then he eventually that's what he ended up doing oh wow <laughs> he didn't realize you could just make money doing the thing he was very skilled at well also you don't have any resources you don't have any connections you don't have any network once you leave you're sort of an island of one and you have to figure it out because you're not allowed to talk to your family you're not allowed to talk to um, anybody you knew in scientology when you leave particularly when you leave that property, there is an L. Ron Hubbard policy that says if you do in fact leave the C organization from that property, you are no matter what to be declared a suppressive person. And so when we, when we eventually escaped in January 2005, um, I escaped on the, like on the 4th and about two, a little, plus or minus two weeks later, um, I helped Claire escape. And then we were um, declared suppressives the day after she left. We were declared suppressives. So they hadn't even contacted us after she left. They tried to track her down and intercept her in Las Vegas when she was taking a bus to where I was in Missouri. And, um, and they failed and she ultimately got to Missouri. But the next day they issued a declare. They told her family, they told my family, they're declared suppressives, that's it. Um, and for a few months, we didn't know this. They didn't tell us that. They just told all our families that. But um, her mother was still actually talking to us, even though she was a Scientologist. And even though she had been told that we were declared suppressives, her mother talked to us for a few weeks or months after that. And then eventually she sent, um, you know, one last message or whatever saying, I'm not going to be able to talk to you anymore after this because she... And this is where science, this is how Scientology kind of weave this web is that 
In order to go on to these upper levels of Scientology, which is called the operating Thetan levels or the OT levels, in order to do that, you have to get an interrogation before you do the level from Scientology on the e-meter. And they will ask you, are you connected to any suppressive persons? And if your own daughter is declared a suppressive person, then they might have a lot of uh, tailor-made questions for that person to ask. If, of course. Do you talk to them on the phone? Have you written letters? And then she would have to confess that she did, in fact, speak to us after we were declared. And then she would have to do some sort of amends or some sort of to make up the damage that she had caused to Scientology by talking to us after we were declared suppressives. But in order to get onto that operating fate level, she would have to have zero contact with us um, to, to be able to go forward. So that's how they control their own members from talking to the other family members. They, they leverage what the members think is their eternal spiritual freedom. They leverage that eternal um, spiritual freedom. And that's how they make it so you don't. So because some people go, well, why would the mother not talk to her daughter? Or why would the father not talk to his son or brother or sister or whatever? And that is how they if you talk to that person, then you're not allowed to be in Scientology. And if you keep talking to that person, then you yourself will get declared a suppressive person. And then you have to divorce your husband and she wouldn't be able to talk to her other kids that were still in Scientology. So it's sort of a, a, a kind of a vicious circle that they just perpetuate. And, um, and that's how, um, that's how they do it. That's how they, hmm. it's, yep. it's uh, not really blackmail. It's sort of a leverage thing. They, they have, they have something that they can hold against you if you don't do what they want. And you really don't have anything that you can use against them. Yeah, Unless you know a bunch of dastardly stuff that they're up to at the international <laughs> headquarters and you're just on YouTube telling everybody about it. Yeah, originally, um, my mother had figured out she in these emails. So it was just about a week of emails where she was, you know, from an, an anonymous email sending us messages. And she was just like, this is the worst thing that, that has ever happened. This is terrible. Um, and she figured out a solution where she was like, I know, I'll just check with Bernie, Mark's dad, who we were with at the time. And that way I can, you know, if, if anything happens, if there's, you know, any medical emergency or any major life event, I'll be able to keep in touch under the radar. But within about a month, Scientology had found out about that. She had obviously confessed that that's how she was planning to keep in touch despite the fact that we were declared suppressives. And then she had to disconnect from Bernie, even though he was never a Scientologist. Oh, interesting. That's that's such a difficult thing when it's your parents in particular. We're all so sensitive about one of our parents choosing anything over us, uh, especially, I mean, I experienced it I, when, when I was nine, my parents got divorced. So any new partner, you start to get a bit, uh, oh, do they, have they chosen this person over me and those kinds of things. Yeah. Um, and so I guess when it's your eternal spiritual, what was the words, your eternal spiritual Something. Freedom, your eternal freedom. spiritual freedom. That's what when you they basically tell you in Scientology, as long as you're continuing to do Scientology, you're on the path to spiritual freedom. And that's the bridge, the bridge that they have that, that it, it's uh, it has one side is counseling and one side is Scientology training. And that bridge is called the bridge to total freedom. So mm -hmm. as long as you're on the bridge and you're going on the way to spiritual freedom, everything's good. And anything you do in Scientology is meant, the, the, the sort of metaphor is that anything you do in Scientology will contribute to your bridge. And they always right. say to your bridge, how are you doing on the bridge? Are you moving on the bridge? And, and they will tell you, if you talk to a suppressive or if you talk to your children, which have been declared suppressives, you will halt your bridge progress. And that's how they refer to it. That's the internal lingo is, oh, but if you talk to them, you're going to get kicked off the bridge or you're going to be, um, you're not going to make any more bridge progress. And what about all the money you've paid? Like some of these Scientologists are three, four, five, a million, uh, 500,000 million dollars across the bridge. And wow. so just talking to your daughter could zero out your progress and they'll make you start from the beginning again. They'll make you oh, go back word. to the beginning and start over 
because they're like, well, obviously you didn't learn anything because along every checkpoint at the bridge, at every single checkpoint, you're being checked. Do you, are you connected to a suppressive? Are you a potential trouble source? Are you all these things? So if you get 500K in and you're still talking to your SP daughter, well, you obviously didn't learn anything. So you get to go back to the beginning. Was, yeah. was that... Is, yeah, go ahead. So, sorry, go on. I was just gonna, I was just going to say, Claire, was that? I mean, was that very? Was that painful? Because the idea is that parents would, they apparently, I haven't got kids, but they would give up their lives for their children or to have a relationship with their children. But this is beyond a life. So that's what your mum's thinking about eternal life and all of that stuff. Did you have you given much thought to those those kinds of aspects of it? And was it quite painful? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, of course, I knew very well the day that I escaped that I, I knew what was coming. There was never a doubt in my mind um, that my mom would choose Scientology over me. It was just the, the fact of the matter of what I grew up with. It was always, you know, there was there is no unconditional love in Scientology. The love from your parents is completely conditional and 100% uh, dependent on your cooperation with the organization of Scientology. So it was not a big surprise. Nonetheless, yes, it was painful. Ironically, I had decided in my own mind, oh, well, if, if I was ever told to disconnect from anyone in my family, I would never do that. <laughs> and then, you know, of course, then I escaped and they turn around and be like, see, you wouldn't want to be ya. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, and, and, and also ironically, and I think it speaks to the level of indoctrination within Scientology, initially, um, her, my, my mother's entire family who those, many of them were never in Scientology were outraged. They were, my grandmother was beside herself and, and I was defending my mother being like, oh. no, no, it's okay. You know, I understand why she's doing this. And, and I know it's, you know, and then finally one day my aunt was like, please stop defending your mother. It's not okay. And then of course, when I had children of my own, the the blinders came off and I stopped, you know, it just changed ah. my perspective completely of, you know, I, I just stopped rationalizing. And, and of course, that was part of the deprogramming of coming out of Scientology to stop believing their labels, stop believing that, you know, I didn't have a right to leave, things like that. That's really interesting because usually you hear that somebody having children uh, is the moment that they start to actually better empathize with their parents and all the you know oh god i was angry at you for so long mum. but actually now i've got kids and for you guys because of the cult aspect i suppose it was the totally flipped um we should go back into how you guys met then so you you two uh do you, i mean mark do you do you remember first laying eyes on claire uh, yeah no i i um <laughs> it's funny <laughs> that you say that because when we were when claire was my supervisor and um my teacher in the course room and I would have to go there. You have to go there every single day for two and a half hours um, to the course room in Scientology. And you usually go, you work from breakfast until dinner. And then after dinner usually is when you go do your two and a half hours. And then um, after you get off um, study, then you go back to work for a few more hours. And then you, you know, you, you clock out at around 11 or 12 o'clock at night. And um, so I would spend two and a half hours in this course room and, and Claire would come over and check on us and that sort of thing. And I, the person that I was doing the course with, I was sort of um, egging him on like, hey, dude, what about this little ginger number over here? Like, you know, maybe you can make that work. <laughs> I had already had a girlfriend at the base, sort of, you know, we weren't allowed to do anything, but we were sort of considered boyfriend and girlfriend. And then that girl got assigned to the, what they call the, um, the Rehabilitation Project Force or the RPF. So she went to Los Angeles and she was never going to come back. And then sort of, so I was sort of like, uh, I was back on the market and he didn't ever do any, the, my, the person that I was twinning with, he never, the, the person that I was studying with, he never made a move. But by the time I was single, Claire had, uh, was kind of maybe going to go out with this other guy. And I knew him. He was, a, he was one of my best friends too. Mm. Tom and Cruise. I was sort of, no, it wasn't Tom Cruise, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but uh, this kid, um, he had a motorcycle and he was, his dad had some money and the fam and they were very, they were sort of like Scientology royalty. 
And um, and so one day I saw Claire riding on the back of his motorcycle around the property, and I was like, "Oh, dude, I can't compete with that. I don't have a motorcycle." <laughs> I don't have anything. And um, but luckily for me, he crashed the motorcycle with Jesus. Claire on the back. <laughs> <gasps> and yeah and then that was the end of that <laughs> it was over and so then i moved in right after that i sort of made my move whoa yeah. L luckily Cl i didn't break any bones but you reminded me mark that um so it was darius and we kind of made this agreement like okay i wasn't here i was never here because we knew it would be way worse if he crashed his motorcycle with me on the back so i just kind of brushed myself off and quickly ran back <laughs> And also, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't want to have to get handled as a potential trouble source because I was involved in an accident. <laughs> oh, because you pulled it, pulled it in. That would have yeah. been. Yeah. If you, have, if you get sick or you're involved in any sort of accident, if you fall out of a tree, if you're in a motorcycle accident, a car accident, any sort of accident where you are injured, in Scientology, you are a potential trouble source. You mu must be connected to a suppressive person. Otherwise, why would that have happened to you? Yeah, and actually, uh, that's true. Even if you don't get injured, any accident is that's tr true. treated that way. I didn't way. think about that. If you just yeah. get in an accident and nothing happens, you're still a potential trouble source. Yeah. Because <laughs> in the Hubbard policy, he says potential trouble sources have accidents. So mm. it doesn't say they get ac they have an accident and they get hurt if they're just in an accident. Yeah. This, that had that had just as a, a bit of an aside that had a big effect in the Danny Masterson scandal. The actor from that '70s show has just gone down for life. I, I believe that had some effect in in how the, the women who were the victims of that were treated in in auditing and, and so forth. Yeah. Well, yeah. That that there's also um, you know probably thousands of Hubbard policies that deal with victims, and anybody who is a victim, um, if something bad happens to you. It's because you've done something bad to somebody else. It's a, it's a, it's a very transactional sort of belief system where if you do something good, good things will happen. If you do something bad, then bad things will happen. And, it, and it's not that it's happening to you. You are the one causing it to happen so that you, it'll stop you from continuing to do bad things. So they believe that if, if you're being assaulted or if you're being, if you get, uh, you know, you lose a finger in a, in a construction accident or anything, that's you trying to do yourself in so that you don't harm Scientology. Yep. Interesting. Gosh, yep. I, I think there's something also attractive about that. I can see why people join for that. Um, I, I think it's a destructive way of thinking, but I also think it's attractive to people who it's a little bit like conspiracy theories. A lot of conspiracy theorists are so scared um, of uncertainty that the idea that there are lots of people in charge and in control is actually better than the idea of like, oh God, it's all just chaos. Oh my God, what do I do? And I suppose joining up to any kind of cult or religion where they say to you, hey, you know, everything that happens in your life, you're actually responsible for it. You can, you've got the power. I think that's, is that part, do you think that's part of the appeal? I do. Absolutely. I, yeah. I, I think <clears throat> it, that if, if yeah. you are given the cause for something and you know how to control that thing and if you can be taught to control the thing that's having making you know if you're getting in accidents or you're doing this then that's sort of appealing like oh i don't have to just be a tumbleweed blowing in the wind i can you know i'm the master of my own destiny the problem with that is that in scientology the only way to be the master of your destiny is to do everything that scientology tells you to do and then you will be able to control your destiny. So, you know, there's people that are sort of, and I, and I do tell this story every once in a while. It's like maybe a guy gets in, they do this thing called a, a stress test or a personality test. And when that person does the Scientology personality test, he essentially tells them everything they need to know in order to, to con him to join them. Mm -hmm. And he tells them, oh, I'm, I'm horrible at relationships and I don't know how to talk to people and, um, and I'm not really successful in business and I don't have a lot of money. And then they get him in and they say, we have a course on how to, um, how to have great relationships and it's only $50. And then you do that and then, you know, fast forward 10 years later, he spent a million dollars on Scientology. He's just getting out of his fourth marriage. Um, he's horrible at relationships and he spent a million dollars on Scientology and he doesn't have any money left. And then you go like, hmm, maybe 
maybe I maybe I'm not so good at relationships after all that. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of the personality test, nobody passes the end result of taking that test. Even if you have a perfect score, they'll say, oh, that's because you can't really face uh, things and you're just glossing over and thinking life is wonderful when it's really not. And we can help you with that. <laughs> well, speaking of a perfect score, Claire, do you remember first laying eyes upon this this worthy student <laughs> yes i do uh yeah it's funny um you know i'm sure we've talked about this before it's a very confined environment and there's only so many candidates in in the market so to speak <laughs> and um anyway so yeah i think the very first time um mark and i spoke on a personal level like outside of work was on new year's day 1992 we had like a four hours off you know at our apartments we didn't have vehicles so we couldn't go anywhere i was uh let's see i had just turned 17. um it might even have been my birthday actually now i'm thinking or the day before whatever hmm. Anyway, we, my friend and I wanted to go to a movie in the local, at the local movie theater, but we weren't allowed to go by ourselves. We had to go with another person, like a male person. And so my friend had a crush on Mark's roommate. So we went over there and she was hoping to get her, the roommate to go with us to the movies. And Mark's like, I'll go. <laughs> we yeah, <were> he, like, <laughs> yeah, he wasn't there. So when they came, they're like, hey, is blah, blah, blah here? I'm like, no. I don't know yeah. where he is. He's not here. And they're like, oh, because females weren't allowed to go into the nearby town. Um, they weren't allowed to walk there by themselves, any females yeah. um, that were Sea Org members. So in order to go to walk to the movies, which I, I want to say is probably about a 20 minute walk to go into the town and walk to the theater, um, they had to have a male Sea Org member with them. And because at that time, um, it was her and her friend um, they came over and I was like, eh, I'll go with you guys. If you want me to go, I'll go. And, um, and it was, um, I don't remember which one. I always forget which one, but we went and saw a Star Trek movie. It was like, you know, Star Trek 17 or whatever it was. <laughs> and, um, and when we went there, um, and I didn't have any, I wasn't planning to go and I didn't care if we saw it or not. It was just like, whatever, I'm, I'll go hang out with these two girls. And um, I think I was about two years, I may have been two years older than them at the time yep. and um and we all three of us slept through the entire movie like as soon as you put a sea org <laughs> member in a dark room um in a nice comfy chair they're gonna just pass out because we don't we never we you know we slept i want to say on an average we slept anywhere from you know four to six hours a night for for years and um and at this time i was tired <laughs> so we all went to sleep and i woke up during the credits and um, I was like, hey, guys, how'd you like that movie? They were both <laughs> passed out when I sort of pretended that I didn't know they were sleeping. And I was like, how'd you guys like the movie? And they're like, what? And I'm like, did you guys fall asleep? Not letting them on that I was asleep the entire time as well. <laughs> <laughs> so you were allowed to go and see movies. Did they have to be vetted or anything like that? Well, no, no. because this was in the, in the early 90s when we were at the headquarters. Um, we would get, sometimes we would get Christmas off and we would sometimes get New Year's off. And then depending on if you were doing really well in your area, you could get every other weekend, you could get a day off. Um, mm. And then I, would, I wanna say probably 94, 1994, 1995, it changed into you just got the Christmas, maybe you got Christmas off, maybe you got New Year's off. And even sometimes in those later years, we didn't get either of those days off. And instead of getting a day off, we'd have a 45 minute dinner on Christmas. So we'd, we, we would, instead of having a 15 minute meal break or a 30 minute meal break, they'd be like, you guys have been doing really good. You're gonna get an extra 15 minutes for dinner. <laughs> and, and the only way we could tell it was Christmas is because that one day we were allowed to wear civilian, meaning normal clothing, not our uniforms. <laughs> right, <laughs> was right. about we call the only that. differentiation. Yeah. Mufti, called, mufti day. Mufti day when you just yeah, wear I don't whatever know what, you want. Yeah, I don't know why mufti. It, it, it sounds like a rude word, doesn't it? But <laughs> it, for some reason, mufti day is t the day at school where, because yeah. I wore a uniform to school and the day we were allowed to wear what we were. And the worst thing ever is you'd have nightmares about this, but you'd forget and you'd wear your suit or whatever to uniform to school. And you'd be, oh, worst thing ever. <laughs> there were a lot of people that didn't have 
um, like they had been in the Sea Org wow. their whole life, and maybe they were you know thirty or forty years old. And these people on these days, like in even this in the nineties, I remember it. There was a guy named Josh Hempfell, and he would show up to like a Christmas party or whatever with the clothes that he owned when he joined the Sea Org in the seventies. So he would show up to one of these events or uh, the day off, you'd be at the property and you'd be like, dude, what did you, did you go in a time machine? Like what happened? And he'd be wearing like a, like a leather vest with like poofy wool on the sides and bell bottoms. And it was sort of like, and he'd be like, no, these are the only civvies I, and that's what we called them civvies, civilian clothes. So he'd be like, these are the only civvies that I have ever owned. And so wow. whenever we'd have a party or whenever we wouldn't be wearing our uniform, he would always dress in his 70s clothes that he had from before he joined the sea organization. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> still still better than wearing the wearing your, 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 the uniform and forgetting that it was actually that civilian day. Yes, and some people yeah. did do that at the base too. Like oh. they didn't even have civvies, so they just come in like maybe they they wouldn't they wouldn't wear their uniform shirt, but they wear the t-shirt and the pants and the shoes and they just not wear their you know, their polyester button down that was uh, issued to them. Yeah. Well, it was so dating back then, obviously, you know, so this is back in the 90s. I was about two or three years old when all this was going on, by the way, which is I just keep thinking whenever you say 19, 1991, 92, I'm thinking, gosh, I was learning to walk probably <laughs> at that point. But uh, so you guys were well ahead of me in that respect. So but but OK, so a date 90s, I'm thinking about all the 90s rom coms and things. You take someone out for dinner, those kinds of things. But it sounds like that cinema you're going to you're going to sleep what like claire tell me what what kinds of could you go out could you go out and buy one another dinner and have romance and things no no it was really just a kind of a well first of all the pattern was anytime you would be dating you know air quotes um it was usually very short like just a few weeks because of course as we've explained before the rules of the sea organization mandate that you're not allowed to do anything beyond like a peck um, anything. Kissing. Yes. If there's exactly. no touching allowed. No, yeah. Kissing mm. is even kissing sort of invites the prying eyes that if they're doing that, they might be doing other stuff. So you can't really date somebody for more than a few months without, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of how I'm trying to say this without breaking any YouTube rules or um, being too crude. But essentially, if you are dating someone and you don't get married, you're just opening yourselves up for an investigation that you're doing other things. Yep. And okay. to be very honest, we were doing other things as well um, before we got married. <laughs> But Not they all never, of them, but, but they never know. caught, but they never <laughs> caught, they never caught us. But um, so that was so our first date, officially our first date could have been that January first date in 1992, yeah, and we of. were we were married by August of that year. Yeah, but wow. but as I recall, um, it was more it was so that was January the movie thing, and then in May was when um, Mark was like, well. Uh, I, I can't remember what what the I remember we exactly. Used. We were in we were at the the place where we lived, and I basically told her we got to lock this up, otherwise we're just going to get in trouble. Like there was no, there was no doubt that we're going to get in trouble if we don't get married because we're doing stuff that we should only be doing if we were married. But but it but, had only been we'd only been officially or unofficially or whatever the C organization version of dating was for like a week or something. And he was like, will you marry me? And I was like, completely taken aback, like, what? <laughs> and then I thought, he's right. He makes a compelling argument. Things aren't <laughs> gonna get better unless we get married. <laughs> yeah, so after that date, after that date in January, um, I, stored, I started to just be a little bit more friendly with her um, and say, hey, you wanna hang out at lunch or you wanna do something? So. Again, we had either 15 minute or half hour meal breaks. So you'd show up to eat maybe a little afternoon and then we would have a muster of all the Sea Org. It, depending on what organization you were with, you would line up and be accounted for with that organization. And that would take place at either 1215 or 1230, depending on what the meal break timing was at that point. And um, so you have to eat and then bus your table and then go outside and hang out for five minutes 
-hmm. or maybe if you ate really fast, you'd have 10 minutes. So we would get to spend either uh, a, a lunch or a dinner together. And that's if we were just eating, we would just go whenever you were supposed to go. A lot of times where the places where I'd work, it would be like, hey, it's 12, 15, I gotta go get something to eat before muster. And then you'd go to the place and eat. So we, I wouldn't spend any time with her. But let's say for maybe a few months, I would spend a lunch or a dinner with her for a few minutes after we'd eaten. And, um, and then when you see that, because everybody is on display, there's no place to go and do that. If you're, if you're going to the place, the dining hall, if you're not in the dining hall, you're outside of the dining hall, just people are just hanging out, maybe having a cigarette or having some coffee before the, the muster. And you see like, oh, look at these two are hanging out or mm -hmm. look at these two are hanging out. You can see, oh, this is what's, this is, this is the dating scene. It's it's on display for everyone to see. You see a couple maybe walk away from where the site is and you see them walk there and walk back. You're like, okay, those guys are working something out. And, um, and so, yeah, we probably did that for a few months where we would just have, we would just be hanging out. We would, and you can, and there's no PDA. If you're doing, if you're like hugging or you're doing, that's like, you would never do that. That's mm -hmm. that's like just paint a giant bullseye on me. Oh, here even, we are kissing. Even holding hands was frowned upon. Yeah, if you're holding hands with somebody, it's like, are you serious right now? Like we've got yeah. a job to do here. We're not here. And that's the other thing. If you're at that place, it's all about the job at hand. So if you're off going lovey-dovey with somebody, it's like, seriously, what are you doing? Are you are you insane? Like we're here to do work. We're not here to be playing grab ass with uh, the ginger from uh, up the hill, you know? <laughs> Pretty much the only privacy we would have is uh, some nights we would make it to ride on the bus home together. So, you know, it's 11 o'clock at night, so it's at least dark. <laughs> uh, that's right. That's where you get a good handhold in. Like, you know? <laughs> Back of the bus, uh, then, holding But then hands. no, like, no private space together or did you no. now if you're in a and that's another thing they, they're very the rules are very strictly organized around um couples so if you live in a male dorm and you have a female in that dorm that's like call the police call the sea org wow. police if there, there's a woman in a male dorm that's 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 not allowed at all and no. even when they came to my room that one time to ask me, they stood outside and said, hey, uh, can blah, blah, blah come out? We're gonna go, and it was like, okay, hold on, let me go check. You know, like, you, you don't even have them come in. No. Otherwise, <laughs> if somebody walked, if another person from that dorm walked out into the front area and was like, hey, what are they doing in here? They would write a report on you and you'd be lit up for having females oh. in a male dorm, so. Yeah, strictly against the rules. Yeah, there's not a, there's, I never thought about that. There's not really a place to go that you can have some privacy because it's a it's a complete snitch culture. If anyone sees you together outside of the work alone, it's sort of like, oh, they'll write a report. Like I saw these two at night um, at the outside of a bir outside of birthing and they shouldn't have been there. They should have been sleeping or they shouldn't have been out there together. And we did get such reports written on us, by the way. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> wow. Probably that yeah. Aaron Smith Levin writing yeah. in loads of reports. <laughs> it it's, is it's funny, funny that you say that because Aaron has a lot of the reports that he wrote when he was in the Sea Org. Oh, did he write about you? Did he know, did you know him? No, we, we didn't work at the same place. Yeah, we weren't at the same Sea Org base. He was at a base in Los Angeles. With and, Chris um, Shelton? Yes. Um, at the yes, he was at that the same bay. Well, not really, because Chris Shelton was what in in all actual facts, Chris Shelton was Aaron's boss inside of the C organization oh. and would write to Aaron. But he worked in a different building, and he didn't even work within the same organization. He worked in a a senior management organization, and um, but it was really just um, somebody would from from the international base would write down saying to do this, and Chris Shelton would have would essentially forward that order to all of the different organizations that were under him of that area. And Aaron was one of those um, guys. Wow. But he was, um, yeah, he was at what's called the PAC base or the Pacific Area Command. Is that what it's yeah. called? Yeah, Paci the big blue buildings in Los Angeles. Yeah, that's called PAC. 
And um, and the only we didn't really have any interaction with those people in, in, unless when I was on the the at Golden Era Productions on a shoot team and we would go to pack to shoot um, the organizations or shoot uh, footage down there and then we would interact with those people. But for the most part, I mean, I don't I don't ever remember meeting Aaron um, ever in Los Angeles. And he was also in Florida in Clearwater. And I don't, and I went there a bunch of times too. I don't ever remember seeing him at either property just because there were hundreds of these guys. And also I think he had hair back then. So I, I was going to ask. Yeah, he had hair. He had, hair. it was, it was short. Imagine. It was short, but he had it. It was there. Um, wow. But um, but he yeah, has, no. He has some of those pictures. With yeah, him he does. With hair. <laughs> yeah. I've got to see that. Yeah. Hey, so what I was thinking one one of these maybe unexpected but beautiful facets of my own relationship uh, with my fiance, which has been nearly ten years now, uh, is that I'm constantly learning new things about her even now. Um, and that's something I didn't really expect. And I'd like to think that's a sign of a progressive growing relationship. You know, you, you don't just learn all at once and then it's like, okay, let's get divorced now because that's it. There's still more to learn. With you guys, that must have been quite extreme. You, you must have, would, you, would it be fair to say you got married and then had to learn about each, who each other were over the years? 100%. Completely. And even still, um, <laughs> like we were, I can't remember which video it was, but we were doing a video with somebody. It might have been, um, another channel or it might have been one of our own channels but she was telling a story and she said something that i didn't know like oh i did this and i worked here and i was like what are you crazy <laughs> because when we're there um it doesn't really matter where you were or where what you did before now we're here now so who cares about that and also there's just not a lot of time so even once we were married in august of 1992 there were times where we didn't see each other for a year. Yeah. Man. Like I was posted at the international headquarters and we were shooting in Los Angeles um, and Claire was in Los Angeles or in Florida. And so we just weren't even in the same state for many months or years. Yep. And, um, and there was even times at the international headquarters where I wasn't allowed to go home. I was restricted to the work area of the property and I couldn't go to the um, the Sea Org birthing or the, the housing that they had. And I had to live, sleep in my office or above a hallway or I had to find some place to sleep. And so I might not have gone home for uh, six, eight months. And Claire was promoted out of Golden Era Productions where we met. She was promoted to Religious Technology Center and they had a different meal time than Golden Era Productions. Mm. So we didn't see each other during the day for meals. And if I didn't come home, I wouldn't see her at home. So And, and we even had a different securing time. So um, I would go home, you know, either an hour to three to four hours later than Mark. So yeah, we weren't spending meal times together. We weren't, um, and then oftentimes he was, Mark, when Mark was not allowed to come home, um, I wouldn't see him for months at a time, even though we were working at the same property. Um, and and factor in that all during our marriage from the very beginning, starting at the very beginning and then progressively getting worse and worse and worse, David Miscavige was constantly pressuring me to divorce Mark. Wow. Why? Because, well, after I was promoted into Religious Technology Center, David Miscavige created a policy um, wherein anyone in RTC could only be married to someone else also in RTC because he considered it sleeping with the enemy if somebody at his level of organization was fraternizing or spending uh, time with somebody from a lower organization. Sleeping with and, the enemy. That's yeah, what he called like, it. He pointedly, uh, Mark and I had been married for eight years and in a meeting one time with just a handful of um, executives in Religious Technology Center, David Miscavige asked me point blank, so did you hear about the new personnel policy I'm implementing? And as it happened, Shelly Miscavige had told me. So I said, yes, sir. And he's like, well, what is it? I'm like, you can only be in RTC if you're married to someone else also in RTC. He's like, that's right. Knowing full well, uh, you know, that I'm married to Mark, who's in Golden Era Productions, it was literally um, just, to drive a drive a dagger in to make sure I knew and he had put me on notice. Do you think David Miscavige wanted you as well? Ugh, that's just a disgusting thought. I don't think so. He he was very fascinated and 
um, earlier when I said if there's a couple that are sort of courting each other and he was very, very keenly aware of any couples that were sort of working something up. And a lot of times he'd be the person that would bust them. He would pull in. And this happened with a couple that was very similar in age to us and that had also had a very similar sort of C organization background. And um, they had been courting and David Miscavige, um, he called the female up to his office in Religious Technology Center. And he just asked her point blank, are you guys in the C organization? Um, they call it out 2D. So it's a, 2D is the second dynamic. And if you do something that's out 2D in the Sea Org, that just means to have um, relations without being married. That the, anything, oh. if you have any sort of relations without being married, it's called out 2D in the Sea Org. And um, he just asked her, "Have you guys gone out 2D?" And she said, "Yes, sir, we did." And um, and then she and then he got all the details, of course. And then he dismissed her. And then he brought the husband up there, and he said. Um, point blank, are you guys going out to do? He's like, no, sir, we haven't. We did this and we've been doing this. And and then after the guy's done explaining and just lying through his teeth, David Miscavige is like, I already had your uh, your girlfriend up here and she oh, told me no. you guys did. So And he was assigned to the religious prep, uh, the rehabilitation project force. And then he was gone for like two or three years. And then oh. he managed, and this was very rare, but he managed to finish the rehabilitation project uh, project force in Los Angeles, I think, and was got okay to come back to the property. And then they got married. And then right after they got married, David Miscavige assigned to the uh, RPF again, and then he left. So, but that's, that was, uh, I mean, that's probably, there's probably a dozen more stories just like that, where yeah. David so Miscavige was the one who, like nobody else, everybody else is like, come on, they're kids, you know, let them do their thing, whatever. But he's like, nope, I'm gonna wreck this thing. I'm gonna drive this thing off the cliff. And he would he would do it every time. He'd be like, what happened to blah, blah, blah? Oh, Dave Miscavige found out, or COB, we called him. COB found out that they were screwing in the electrical room and he sent the husband to the RPF. And that was another thing. He would almost always send the husband to the RPF and the girl would, she would get in trouble, but she would just stay on her job and, and stay at the property. Sometimes. And I wanna, or, or sometimes, or yeah. he would specifically send them to entirely separate geographical locations to make That's sure true. that they never reunited. Yeah, send so one to the know. RPF in Florida and the other one to the RPF in Australia. So yeah. there's there's no way that they're going to get back together. It could yeah. be five to ten years before they even see each other again, much <laughs> less not have another, start up another relationship in either one of those locations. Yeah, that, that's why we always say uh, the fact that we were just able to celebrate 31 years of marriage makes us a statistical anomaly for having survived 13 years of marriage in the sea organization somehow managed to escape somehow managed to you know it was like starting our marriage over again when we left because wow. we had we the our marriage had been in a certain environment that was uh you know toxic and <clears throat> so yeah it was like learning who we are all over again <laughs> One of, That's so one, fascinating. One of the best stories, Andrew, is when we first left in 2005, we got a, um, we were living with my father for a while, and he had a, a like a house in uh, Missouri, and then we ended up getting our own little apartment. And Claire said, "I'm gonna make, um, I'm gonna make dinner tonight," and I was like, "Okay," and she's like, "I'm gonna make spaghetti bolognese," and I'm like, "You know how to cook?" We had been <laughs> married for 13 years. She had never ever cooked me a meal in 13 years. I was like, wow. yes, I know how to cook. I yeah. taught my myself how to cook when I was 13 years old. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's just extraordinary. That, that's the sort of like to help people understand to be married to somebody and not even knowing if they know how to cook. Yep. That is the level of like in 2005, we were like, I got to figure out who this broad is. You know, like this is, uh, I didn't even know she could cook. Okay, well, there you go. You know, I, th I feel like firstly, I think this, there are actually good at positive aspects to this. Obviously there were horrible bits inside the, the cult, right? Let's, but, but, but the positive sides, because I think you've gone through such hardships, it, you know, things are less unlikely to be as bad as that again. Like you've survived through that. And also you get to learn about each other again. You get to, whereas if somebody learns in the, you know, sometimes you get that honeymoon period for like the first year or second year and they go and they have amazing holidays and they get really close and it's like, oh, now that's everything. 
and we're done. And they just so it burn brightly and they finish. So I think that's quite quite an, a, a positive thing for for you guys. Um, Claire, did you did was it was it an attractive thing that? Well, two things here. I guess, firstly, it's interesting that you guys were married also for that time. And Claire, you were at a higher level. I think you were OT5 by the end. And, and Mark, you were OT3, which means that you knew... Oh, no, below that. You were, you needed to get to OT3. To... I've never even read Dianetics, Andrew. I've, <laughs> I've not done... The only counseling that I got in Scientology, like the only major, like, you know, weeks and weeks at a time of getting counseling, the only counseling I've had was from Tom Cruise. That's it. I, wow. I don't... I haven't read Dianetics. I never got to the state of clear. I don't, I don't have like on that. When I talked about that bridge, I'm at the bottom of the training and the bottom of the counseling. I have literally done nothing in Scientology my whole life for, for, you know, of any consequence. Like if I was in Scientology still to this day, I would be considered the worst Scientologist in the world because I never <laughs> did anything on the bridge to total freedom. I'm just still at the bottom, just Amazing. going like, eh, everything's good. Right, so but that's yes. the point, is that you were together, and that's what David Miscarriage, I suppose, was worried about, is that you're going to find out stuff. You're not supposed to find out stuff till you're further up the bridge, and Claire knows about Lord Zeno and all of that stuff, and you didn't know. Okay, so just to clarify, though, the reason David Miscavige didn't want us talking had nothing to do with the upper levels. It was simply that, for example, I was in meetings witnessing him, David Miscavige physically abusing executives, <sighs> And that's the type of information he didn't want me sharing with Mark or any couples sharing with each other. What David Miscavige did behind closed doors, he wanted to make sure that the only people that witnessed that were 100% in his camp, 100% under his control, and never talked to anybody outside that organization for security, mm -hmm. for his own protection. Yeah. Did you tell Mark that stuff? When we I left. Didn't. I did. When I left, yeah, when, absolutely. After we left, so I knew David Miscavige was beating people up, but I thought he was only beating up us low guys. Like I only thought he was wow. beating up the workers. But then when we left, I was like, "Hey, does he? You know, he how he used to beat on all of us? Did he ever beat on?" And she was like, "Oh, he beat on everybody all the way, all the way up to Religious Technology Center." When she told me about the guys he was beating up in Reli Religious Technology Center, I was sort of like. Oh my god and that that's the sort of thing David Miscavige didn't want us knowing. And also she was in I mean you were like number 3, number 4 in all of science. She was right below David Miscavige. So she knew about financial things, internal finance things, how much David Miscavige was getting paid each year, bonuses he was getting. He could get a $30,000 bonus from Relig Religious Technology Center at the end of the year. We would be luck lucky to clue to clear $2,500 in a year at my level. Like in the whole year, getting, you know, 46 bucks a week, I don't even know what that is, times 52, but it ain't 30K, I know that much. Um, I don't think I made, I actually got in, in the States, in the United States, when you get paid, um, they have to pay into this thing called Social Security. So they have all of your income for your whole life as, as reported to them. And in the entire, 15 years that I was in the international headquarters, I made a total of, I think, $25,000 for 15 years of 100 to 120 hours a week. So those sort of details are the ones that David Miscavige would not want out in the wild and, yeah. uh, and lower Sea Org members to know. That makes sense. That makes sense. So Claire, you couldn't share the truth about David Miscavige's, and for anyone who doesn't know, that's the leader of Scientology, about his brutality. Uh, was Mark able to share with you about his auditing sessions with Tom Cruise? Was that a cool look for Mark? Or was it just like, like from your perspective, were you like, oh, wow, Mark's in there with Tom Cruise? Or was it just like, meh? Well, so so the, the auditing Mark got with Tom Cruise was before I had arrived to the property. I didn't uh. find out from Mark that Tom Cruise had audited him until after we escaped. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? I can't believe that. <laughs> I, well, was that hard to keep quiet, Mark? Not really, because I was told. Um, I mean, I was told by, there was a gentleman that used to work directly for David Miscavige called Marty Rathbun. And Marty Rathbun was the one who came and saw me and said, um, and I'm shortening this, in my book, Blown for Good Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology, um, I tell the whole story. But essentially I was told, you can't tell anybody you work with in the C organization. You can't tell anybody, um, your family. You cannot tell anyone that Tom Cruise is your auditor. You can't. It's impossible. Don't tell anybody. 
And that sort of was my view for a long time until one day when I was in the middle of the counseling session, um, we had to leave and go somewhere else on the property to get something. And Tom Cruise is like, oh, I'll take you on my motorcycle. And I was just like, okay, I'm, I, this is out of my control now. If anybody sees me, they're going to know that I'm hanging out with Tom Cruise. They're going to see us driving around on a motorcycle on the property. The property is about a little over 500 acres, I think 450 or it's over 400 plus acres. It's a giant property. So to get anywhere of any consequence, you have to go on a motorcycle or walk and it would take forever. And it's also in the middle of the desert. So it could be 120 degrees outside. You don't want to walk 30 minutes to an, the other side of the property in 120 degrees heat. So Fahrenheit, all you uh, non-US people. Just hot. Um, what's that? <laughs> It's, it's hot. I don't know what the centigrade is, but it's hot. It's hot. Yeah. It, it, yeah. You could just, um, before I would talk about that muster, we had black shoes. If you were standing at muster for 15 minutes, the tops of your feet would get burned because the sun is that bright. So that's how hot wow. it is there. Um, but we got, I got on the back of his motorcycle and we drove to the other side of the property and, and it was during a meal. So everybody saw us. And I was sort of like, okay, well, this is on this dude, not me. I can't tell him. I was not allowed to say, no, I'll walk, you drive. I, he said, get on the back. And I had to ride bitch on the motorcycle. And we went down to the <laughs> meeting. And, um, and when we get there, um, we're just walking around with all the staff. And it's sort of like, holy shit, Tom Cruise is hanging out with Mark. And so at that point, anyone who saw us knew. But even then, I was still not allowed to tell anybody that he was my counselor. It was just like, we don't know why they're hanging out, but they're hanging out. So mm -hmm. it was just like, whatever. And, and that happened, I wanna say that happened about a year or more before Claire showed up. Yeah. So by the time Claire got there, he had already left the property and he wasn't doing any counseling anymore. And I was just, I just went back to work like everything was normal. And then I, I don't even remember how it came up, but at some point it was sort of like, um, you know, oh yeah, when Tom Cruise was auditing me. She was like, what? You know? yeah. Oh yeah, no, he, he did all my counseling when I first got to the property in 1990. But, um, but then also um, when he came back in 2004, um, it was sort of set up like, hey, we need to have Mark here because he audited Mark back in the 90s. And so when he came there and he was going through one of the areas that I was, by this time I was a producer or I had a very high level um, post at, it, within Golden Era Productions. And so when he came to the area, it was like, hey man, you know, Dr. Double Handshake and you uh -huh. know, how's it been and what are you working on? And you're like, yeah, now I'm the boss of all these people. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> And we just talked for a few minutes and then that was it. And then I didn't, I didn't see him again after that. That was in, um, I want to say that was in 2004, but, um, but yeah, it wasn't actually publicized within the Sea Org or even the property that he was my counselor and Scientology for all since we left, they never comment on this one thing. They'll tell, they'll tell you all the other dirty laundry that they want everyone to know about me made up or real but they don't say anything about tom cruise because it sort of entangles him in all of this mess that's going on right now they don't want to mm. i mean i get that's my assumption they don't want to drag him into it was there a story about am i making this up i feel like you told me a story about something sort of beeswax or honey or something and tom cruise that was the thing we when we were in the session um, before every Scientology auditing session, you do a little te uh, a test that um, it, 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 it sort of um, tells th them if you're ready to get a counseling session, if your body is ready to do this. And if you don't have enough energy, if you haven't slept or you haven't eaten correctly, when you do this test, um, the needle is supposed to move a certain amount. You basically, you take in a deep breath, and you let it out and the needle on the e-meter is supposed to fall a certain distance. And if you haven't slept enough or you haven't eaten enough, it, it doesn't go the whole way. It just goes Meh. And so we went, I went to go do a counseling session with him and it just went Meh. And uh, he was like, mm, you're not, it's called metabol, metabolism test. And he goes, you're not metab, you, d you didn't uh, pass the metab test. And I was sort of like, well, I slept and I ate, I don't know what else to do. And then he goes, have you ever tried bee pollen? And I'm, I'm literally looking at him like, bee pollen? What kind of freak <laughs> are you? 
Who eats bee pollen besides <laughs> bees, you maniac? Anyway, but then, um, so that's what he said. Oh, do we have any bee pollen? They didn't have any bee pollen where we were doing the counseling. And so he's like, well, we'll go down to the canteen and we can get some. What, um, wasn't he even shocked that you'd never had oh, bee yeah, no. pollen before? <laughs> he literally, you haven't had bee pollen? I'm like, bee pollen? He goes, well, did you take your vitamins today? I'm like, vitamins? I was like, who is this guy? This guy's, this guy's a riot. Vitamins? You think I've got money for vitamins? <laughs> no, well, you I haven't taken vitamins this life. How about that? <laughs> you fell asleep though, didn't you? What do it while doing the auditing with it? That was later, but yes, I did. So essentially, between that, um, so we didn't. He, we went to go to the canteen to get the bee pollen, but then the next day, um, I think there was some other similar thing, and um, I was able to pass that test. But during the session, I fell asleep. So, and that is the ultimate sort of um, worst thing that can happen to the auditor. You don't get in trouble as a pre-clear if you fall asleep. That's all on the auditor. Like well, the auditor- Well, you kind of do, you kind of well, do, because the, the, according to Hubbard, if you fall asleep, it's because you have missed withholds. So, uh, you know, well, that, either that's way, how the auditor would deal with that is find out what you're not telling him. <laughs> well, but he wasn't advanced enough and he wasn't uh, at that level to be able to do that. So they had to just figure out why I was falling asleep. Well, at that time, I was working on the night shift of my job. So when I would come in at dinner time, I would eat dinner, and then I would go in, in, in session with Tom Cruise. So it was basically right after my breakfast, I would go in with him, and my body was just still tired, and I wasn't sleeping a lot anyway. So they moved me, and my boss was the day shift person that did my job, and I was the night shift person. And this was sort of a slimy thing that happened was they said to my boss, you need to go on the night shift and Mark needs to go onto the day shift. So by the time he goes into session with Tom, he's fine for to go into a session. He's ha He's been properly fed and he's been awake enough of the day that he can just go in session and, and be fine. And then I was getting special meals. They were making really nice meals for me and I would get a full meal break. So if we were only eating for you know 10 or 15 minutes, I would get a full half hour. And people were really freaking out because I would be sitting at the table with everybody else and then someone would bring me a pre-made plate of food instead of just having to dish it up like everybody else. And it was better food than everybody else was eating. Like, hey, what the fuck's up with Mark? How's he eating all the good shit? What, like, what, what's going on? I'm just like, oh, I'm just on a special diet right now or something like that. <laughs> I just had to make up something. But um, so, yeah, when I fell asleep, um, they did a whole thing to move it all around so that that would never happen again. And, and to my best recollection, there was a few times where I started like what they call in Scientology, it's actually, they have a word for it. It's called going aniton, where you just like, you just pass out. Which and, stands um, for analytical attenuation. Yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, exactly. when, it would, when I would get <laughs> near that point, I would sort of tell myself, I would like, you know, kind of be like, oh dude, you're, you got to you got to pull it together if you fall asleep again there's no that, like there's no other thing we can do i can't get more sleep i can't get better food i got to not fall asleep so but um but that was also right when he was counseling me he had just filmed uh days of thunder so he had that longer hair and he and nicole was there right like we were getting uh, he was auditing me on one side of the room and on the other side of the room was Kirstie Alley, Nicole Kidman, um, just like, you know, five, 10 feet from us studying their courses and getting ready to do their counseling or whatever they were working on. And um, and so it was sort of a surreal thing where you've got Nicole Kidman, Kirstie Alley and Tom Cruise auditing me. And in Scientology, when you're getting counseling, you're supposed to just be in the zone with your counselor. And my counselor is Tom Cruise, and there's these other two gals over here. It's hard to be in that zone. And I think one of the ways I would cope with that is I would just block everything out, but I would also block Tom out too, and I just fall asleep. So, <laughs> and, and by the way, side comment Kirstie Alley was only there as a token celebrity. Like, yeah, she oh, was see, a prop. This is where the celebrities come. Like, she didn't normally do her training or counseling there, but she, anytime somebody important, you know, big was brought in, she would be brought in as an additional person to fill the course room. Like they, oh. did, they did the same thing with, when Lisa Marie Presley was getting auditing there. Kirstie Alley was the prop. <laughs> oh, to wow. make it like, just sort of bring, bring her out for Tom and for Lisa. To make yep. it like they're not like Tom 
and Lisa aren't getting special treatment. Kirsty comes here and all these guys, Tom comes here. So it's sort of like, oh, this is normal, even though uh, Kirsty never, as far as I know, Kirsty never really did anything there. She was just sitting there reading something, uh, some Scientology materials in the course room, you know, to, to put on a show for that. She was a prop. Yeah. Wow. Gosh, <laughs> she won't have liked that if she realized it, I suppose. Um, Claire, I want to ask um, about South Park and the OT level five. Were you, was there a point? Okay, so double question. Firstly, what, I don't want to go into the whole Lord Xenu <laughs> thing, but yeah, I do, actually. I have been thinking, people make the mistake, I think, when they don't know too much about Scientology, of thinking Lord Xenu is some sort of Jesus or God figure. But my understanding is he's the bad guy. So who's the good guy? I don't even understand. And, and also, did you fully believe in that stuff before leaving? I didn't, no. I think um, it's fair to say that anybody who's left Scientology that did the upper operating Thetan levels all were like, what the heck, when they read those <laughs> materials. Um, to me, it's like the perfect analogy is the Emperor's New Clothes. It's a very elaborate system where you're led up your entire life to believe that this is going to change your entire life. It's going to blow your mind. And by the way, if it doesn't work for you, it's because you're a bad person or you're a, what they call a bypass case, meaning you have to go do the entire counseling from the very beginning all over again. Uh, you know, so it's high stakes and uh, and you can't talk with anybody about it either. So it's not like I could tell Mark, dude, I just did. I just did yeah. read OT3 today and I, I, I don't know what to do because, no, you just kind of have to roll with it. And by that by that point, the level of indoctrination is such that you just plod along and do what they tell you to do. And it's it's oh. kind of sad. And but the <clears throat> mind contortions that it puts you through are outrageous. And in fact, after we left and Mark started talking out, um, I had I had a conversation with a woman who had actually been Hubbard's auditor at one point. And I was like, I'm just really trying to come to terms with how Mark was able to wake up so quickly and how I'm still trying to just like figure out what's what, you know. And she said, well, did you think maybe it had to do with the fact that you were on the upper levels? And, you know, have you considered the impact of those mind contortions you put yourself through? And I was like, actually, no, I hadn't. So thanks. <laughs> That's very helpful. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is yeah, helpful, it, I suppose. It took me watching the South Park episode. I was done. That was it. That okay. was it. literally a half hour. I was like, oh, that's the thing? Really? <laughs> and I looked at her, I was like, because even when we, I was watching the South Park episode, I was like, this is crazy. Like, this is just ridiculous. And I I asked her, I, she was right there. And I said, is this I didn't, And I surreal? didn't watch it, though. I was still like, I can't watch that. You can go ahead. You do whatever you want. I'm not going to judge, but I can't watch that. <laughs> and she said, no, that's real. And I was like, no way. Like she, when she verified that what they were saying in the cartoon was in fact what the materials in Scientology said, I was just like, oh, this is ridiculous. We're, I'm good, I'm out. I'm I, like, whatever I still believed, I knew like, okay, this is certainly ridiculous. And, 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 it, and, and, and it was funny because somebody had asked me when I still worked there, I was working with a guy that was helping us with these audio visual systems that we're doing. And he asked me, he's like, what's up with all the space aliens and all that stuff? And I was like, what are you talking about? Dude? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, I heard you guys like pray to aliens or you're doing so stuff with aliens. And I'm just like, dude, that's the, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And that is what most, I would say 90% of Scientologists what they know because they don't get to that level and they don't know about the aliens. So even when I was first starting to do YouTube videos, people would write to me, Scientologists would be like, you know, that's not true. Why are you saying that? And I'm like, oh, they don't, they haven't gotten there. So they don't know. They don't know <laughs> that eventually you're going to find about this guy, Lord Xenu. And really Lord Xenu is not like their Satan or their devil. He's more like Lex Luthor to Superman. That's what Lord okay. Xenu is. Lord Xenu, is, like you said, He's just a bad guy. He he's just a uh, a bad guy from seventy five million years ago that happens to be an, a galactic lord in another you know star system or something like that. But who, um, who established Earth as a prison planet and then offloaded all of the what was it the criminals 
the artists, the um, scholars just like, boom, packed them up and shipped them out off to prison earth. Because of overpopulation on his home planet. Yeah. Yep. And threw them in volcanoes for some reason. Yeah, because that was the way you did it from where he came from. I mean, let's not judge. But yeah. the um, energy, <laughs> the energy required to get millions of people or per, whatever they are, aliens or whatever, across to the earth when he could have just put them into space and left them there. They could have just well, died there if he was trying to kill them. I don't know what he's trying to do. Totally. And that is sort of my my newfound argument now, which is I'm not saying that didn't happen. I'm saying if it did happen and this Lord Xenu guy had the technology and the wherewithal to move several billion people from yeah. another planet and bring them to Earth, just logistics and time travel, light year, nine weeks at light speed, all that. I'm like, that's the guy I'm putting my money on. I'm not putting it on a 413 <laughs> guy named Dave. I mean, this Lord Xenu sounds like he's got it together. Honey, as yeah. long as we're talking about all this, you got to talk about your BTs activate theory. Okay, yeah. So that's the other thing. What? So Lord Xenu put all these souls into volcanoes, and then, this, then the souls escaped from the volcanoes, and they attached themselves to humans. So any person on Earth, and this is, in, this is what it says in Scientology, could have tens of thousands of these souls, they call them body thetans, L. Ron Hubbard called them body thetans, inside you that are, uh, they're the ones that are making you do irrational things and the why you can't get the right job and why you can't meet the right girl. They're the reasons. And if you- And why, it, and why you have cancer. Yeah, anything that happens is from those guys. And mm -hmm. so they, what you do on these upper operating thetan levels is you excise them, you get them away from you. You have to do that every day for at least a few times a day for years and years and years to get rid of all these things. And I, and I argue this Scientology, why not harness the power of all those 10,000 <laughs> um, aliens and not try to evict them or throw them out on the street just hey, have a pep talk, you know, maybe like talk to them and say, guys, we're all working. You want to stick around? We got to work towards this. We got to get me a good job, a good girlfriend. I need my bank account to be fat. I need these are the things I need and harness the energy. That's yeah, all let, I'm just saying. Let's work together. BTs yeah. activate. This, and then that this way, is blasphemy. That way you stay good with Xenu. You stay good with the body thetans. Everybody wins. I'm more of a rising tides raise all ships kind of guy. Like, let's not throw these body thetans out on yeah. their ass. Let's help them out. <laughs> There's anyone from OSA, which the Off Office of Special Affairs, who's watching this now at Scientology, are just now thinking, you see, they're all Satanists or they're all, they just want to work <laughs> with the bad, evil stuff. You know, uh, I, I had a funny story the other day because there's a guy I play uh, tennis with. I started playing tennis. I'm now a guy who plays tennis. But I played tennis and this this guy, he said, hey, you're a YouTuber, you know, what, what sort of thing? And I said, oh, you know, cults. And one of them is Scientology. That's the main one that everyone's interested in, Scientology. And he goes, oh, what's that? And I started explaining the whole alien stuff. And he was just sort of sat there with a straight face like, huh. Huh. And over the weeks, like he didn't really mention it, but every now and then he asked a bit of a question. He's like, so what's Lord Zena? What's all this? And I said, well, I think it's because of overpopulation. I think it's because of this and that. Uh, and then all the aliens did this and the Thetans came out of a volcano and all this stuff. And it took months and months where well, we still played tennis, but he was a bit sort of cautious of me. And I realized after months and months that he thought I was a YouTuber who was like, a Scientologist myself. He, he, oh, no. So eventually he said like, he was like, so you really believe this stuff then to me? And I was like, no, 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 you don't, you've misunderstood the whole thing. That's not what the channel is. The channel's like against Scientology. And he just, he just wasn't, he wasn't getting it. So I, I, I think for a while I've got a reputation at my gym of being like this big Scientologist now though. Well, you do know, I mean, let's be fair. Even the fact that you know all these little deep and like why Z move the people <laughs> like most people don't know that like why well why did he have to get ready oh it's because of overpopulation you'd be like even that is a <laughs> tiny little detail that most people don't remember or know so but uh mm. yeah no and that is the and that is really if you think about it that's what they're keeping a secret is the lord xenu stuff beating people stealing money from elderly people ruining families breaking up all the that that's out, that's in the open. They don't mind. I mean, they probably mind, but they they don't really keep that a secret to any degree. The thing that they keep a secret is this Lord Zenu thing for some weird thing because Hubbard said, if you find out about the Zenu story before you've before you're at that level, you will get pneumonia and die. So even though 
I like I said earlier when I watched the South Park thing, I'm like, oh, this is so dumb. I'm out. This is I got this he, is ridiculous. He literally said to me, "Okay, I'm doing a test. Yeah, I'm going to read all the OT levels tonight. If I die of pneumonia tomorrow, I take it back. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. So but the if next I'm morning, okay, if I'm okay, all bets are off. <laughs> yeah. The <but> next <laughs> morning, I literally laid there in bed that night and going, "Wow. Okay, this is it. Because you know." realize i think i'm probably 32 at this time 32 years old yeah my whole life all i knew is if you find out about this stuff before you're ready you're gonna die of pneumonia so i go to sleep that night i have a perfectly good night's sleep i think i wake up in the morning and i and i took the deepest breath i've ever taken away not even a sniffle <laughs> i was like it's bullshit. i knew it it's bullshit. you know what's interesting i've got a i've got a book out next april about the sort of secrets and cults and influences as well youtubers and how we're all involved in this big sort of dynamic of keeping secrets and hierarchies and all these kinds of things and i'm pretty sure i write about both of you i hope you don't mind oh, uh, and all. i <laughs> and I do tell Mark's story about waking up and, and realizing he didn't have pneumonia because the whole point is that's that's how the cult, you know, they get you through, through secret keeping and making you not keep. So I've told that story in the book. And I just think that's amazing. And that was was that also just after watching South Park and realizing like, hey, I've watched South Park and I'm okay. Yeah, no. So that day after I found out about that, I said, well, I'm just going to look up. You can, by the way, Scientologist. Any OT level or operating Thetan level in Scientology, it's on the internet. You can read all of it. You can read the whole thing that they showed in South Park. You can read L. Ron Hubbard's original handwritten writings of that. And there's yeah. even a lecture where he talks about it and tells almost the entire story in his own words, audio wise. So I went and hunted down all those things. I sat there and I read OT3, OT4, OT5, OT6, all the way up to OT8. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then then that's when I told her. I said, I read everything, babe. I read everything. So if not just hearing the Xenu story would kill me, I read every single OT level all the way to OT eight. So that was if, like, great. if not just OT three <laughs> was gonna kill me, I've now read I've now watched and read every single thing that you can read that you we weren't supposed to read. So if I don't get pneumonia tomorrow and maybe Maybe I just hacked the whole system. Maybe you have to read it all in one sitting not to get the pneumonia. I don't know. But for me, I'm good. <laughs> you did well. And well, it's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because I guess everyone, when you leave any kind of cult, there's still part of you that still believes a little bit. Claire, you were talking about how that's been difficult to to get past. So, I mean, would you, have you watched, Claire, have you watched the South Park episode, for example, since? Would, would that even be difficult now or weird now to oh, watch? Not, no, not now. And, and honestly, mm. it was not, um, so it, in retrospect, looking back on it, it was not that I was ever a true believer. It's that um, when Scientology became a choice, I had to, you know, figure out that and realize and wake up and realize that I'd been indoctrinated from birth to believe that this was the only way. And you have to factor in too that the leverage and control buttons, like if I walked away, it meant I would never speak to my family ever again. That was more the, the fear factor for me. Um, yeah. You know, and I had to, I had, did have to come to terms with that. Yeah, no, I get that. So I guess there's those two sides of it, because I think, Mark, you, you've said to me before, I think that so, you think some people will have been converted by South Park, for example converted away from Scientology? Out. Yeah, deconverted. Oh, 100%. Because yeah. the other thing is that, I mean, and I believe, I really do believe that comedy is the great equalizer. Yeah. I think that. I think that comedy, it we're all the same in comedy. And when you make fun of somebody who's up here and it's funny, then you bring that person down to your same level. And that essentially is what South Park did for me. It was funny, but it was also the truth. And so you go like, oh, I get it. Scientology is a giant joke. Like they're not, and that's the other thing, <clears throat> to be fair, we were also indoctrinated that Scientology is, everyone loves it. And everyone's talking about Scientology and they love Scientology and we're getting people so, off drugs and we're doing this and we're doing that. So you think that Scientology is is highly regarded in the outside world. And then when you leave and go to the outside world, they're making fun of it on 
on South Park on cartoons that are making fun of it. Yeah, that, and, that's why Scientology is so against comedy and says it's a bad thing and you're evil if you make jokes or laugh about anything pretty much. <laughs> so that's sort and that and 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 I I want to say that may be why I do take the method and the kind of tact that I take is you got to make this somewhat amusing you can't if we just told the horror stories all day and all night it would be like yeah these guys are bumming me out man like you're harsh in my gig <laughs> dude like take it easy with all the you know the drama but if if it's if it's a little bit if we play a little bit and we tell the story then i think it's a little bit easier digested and for both for people that don't know about scientology and scientologists as well because scientologists um a lot of them know there's something going on and there's something they're not being told, but they don't know what it is. They just know, like there's some, there's more to this story than we're being told. And when and and when you tell those stories and you tell what happened behind the scenes, and you and then they go, oh, these guys are just like us. They're not anything special. There's no OT8s and like and in Scientology, if you've gotten to operating Thetan level eight and you're very highly trained in the counseling and everything, you're sort of like a big deal in Scientology, whether you're a big deal or not. So when you know that those guys, the only thing they know is a bunch of space alien stories. That's the only difference between us. They're still a regular person and they have no special powers. They can't move anything with their mind. They can't they, predict They the have future. a few hundred thousand dollars less <laughs> yeah. after, yeah, they just after have giving that all to Scientology. <laughs> yeah, they have lighter wallets. That's the only difference yeah. between them and us. <laughs> oh man, well look, people, Go and check out the brilliant Headley's channel, Blown for Good, which means left Scientology for good. It's not a, a, a sexual thing. Um, but, you know, go, Blown for Good. I said it to my, my fiance before and she was like, uh, I was like, no, it means they leave. They left Scientology. Yes. Um, <laughs> Even and Aaron, like when it. I started my YouTube channel, Aaron's like, are you going to change the name of your channel? Because it was always just based on my book, Blown for Good was the name of my channel. Yeah. I was like, no, I'm not going to change the channel. He's like, but it says Blown for Good. I'm like, yeah, I like that. I think it's hilarious. If People you know, go like, you know. what's going on over there? <laughs> yeah. Well, get hold of Mark's book as well. Also not adult entertainment. It's also about leaving Scientology. So do go over and do that. And also hit the like on, on their version of this video. And, and please come over to Andrew Gold and do vice versa for this one. And and uh, yeah, I think I think that's it. Just keep watching our channels, keep hitting those like buttons, and 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 that's all, isn't it? Thanks, Andrew. I cool. appreciate you Always having us on. Always a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks for having us on. Oh, thank you guys. And.